Good morning. Uh, here's your weekly encouragement from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's two different types of revelation. That is the way God reveals himself to mankind. Uh, the first is a silent revelation or a general revelation. Uh, we see that in verses 1 through 6, uh, the created realm. Uh, as some have said, and uh, that uh, there are marks of God's creative hand in all of his creation. We look at... Uh, the perpetual uh, seasons that come and go. It, it speaks to a God who is orderly. Uh, that uh, spring uh, comes after winter. That summer comes after spring. And on and on uh, it goes. This is the way God creates. And so even the, na even the natural realm, nature, speaks of the greatness and the might of God. Uh, the psalmist talks about uh, the heavens declaring the glory of God. As we look at uh, sunsets, uh, weather patterns, uh, clouds, and, and everything else, he, he talks about uh, the sun and the moon. Uh, all of these uh, speak to and testify to uh, God's uh, greatness and the miraculousness of his uh, creative abilities in his creation. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting uh, reading uh, up for this. Jonathan Edwards actually uh, was a, a, a big fan of nature, apparently, as a, a child especially. He was fascinated by it uh, and would go out in his New England, outside his New England home, and and apparently did a great deal of research on uh, spiders on the forest floor. There's one breed of spider in particular that caught his imagination because uh, the spider, he said, would uh, wait for uh, a light breeze to blow and then would spin uh, a, a good length of uh, web uh, so that it caught and blew in the wind. And so uh, the spiders, uh, Edwards observed, would uh, fly across the forest floor like kites and would able be able even to control how far they would go by uh, retracting or producing more uh, web. Here's what he said about it in his journal. Um, we hence see the exuberant goodness of the Creator, who hath not only provided for all the necessities, but also for the pleasure and recreation of all sorts of creatures and even the insects and those that are most despicable. Again, even uh, spiders coasting across the floor testify to the greatness of God. However, uh, in all the greatness of the created realm, there is a, 
a shortcoming of general revelation. And the shortcoming of general revelation is, is that general revelation doesn't lead us to Christ. It can, can get us to the doorstep, maybe. Uh, but you can't learn about Jesus simply by observing uh, uh, spiders in their natural element. Uh, God's general revelation is silent on that. And this is why, and this points us, Psalm 19 points us to a greater type of revelation, the second type of revelation, which is what we would call special revelation. God's spoken word, uh, the, the Bible. That's why we need the scriptures. That's why, as, as many would profess, well, you know, I worship God on my own terms. Uh, I've, I've had many a friend say, well, I can get closer to God uh, hiking on Sundays than I could uh, going to church. Well, no, that's not the case. Because, yes, it's good and there is some benefit to uh, getting out into the uh, created realm. Uh, but the created realm falls short in that it doesn't uh, testify to us uh, specifically and explicitly uh, of the work of Jesus Christ. So David then goes on in verses 7, 8, and 9 to speak of uh, the greatness. He first of all talks about the greatness of God in creation, but uh, uh, you'll notice he, he actually goes even further. Uh, I want to say he almost goes overboard, but he doesn't go overboard. He just, uh, uh, it's sort of rapid fire here. You can almost catch his excitement as uh, he transitions from general to special revelation and his uh, joy, his exuberance uh, testifies even more to the greatness of God's uh, special revelation. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, verse 7, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Uh, notice uh, just rapid fire. It's true. God's word is true. Uh, in, in a world of misinformation and disinformation that I think we're currently living in. Uh, how uh, uh, comforting is that to you, Christian, that God's word doesn't misinform, it doesn't disinform you. Uh, it doesn't take a bunch of facts and mix them up and, and sort of use that to whatever it's uh, intention or uh, uh, bias is. God's word is true. It's reliable, David says here. Um, he goes on, notice to say, enlightening the eyes. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, sort of a, a literary clue here uh, that takes us back to, if you read 1 Samuel uh, 14, King Saul made this sort of uh, blunderous decree that, that if his army stopped pursuing the Philistines, uh, he would kill them. He takes this oath that they aren't to eat anything until they uh, have killed more Philistines. Well, his son Solomon isn't around because, uh, excuse me, not Solomon, Jonathan isn't around uh, because what's he doing? He's busy killing Philistines when Saul makes this silly oath. But he's leading this band of uh, soldiers after that, and they find themselves in the uh, uh, forest, and they find this honeycomb, and um, uh, Jonathan sticks his staff or his spear into a honeycomb and eats it, uh, and everybody's shocked. That, oh, you know, do you not know? Now you're going to die. And he says to them, you know, do you not see how my eyes have been brightened by eating this? Surely. Uh, it has revived my heart and will revive yours as well. In other words, he's saying uh, it gives him energy. It gives him what he needs to go and to do his job. David's saying that God's word does the same for us, that, that we as Christians need our souls to be refreshed, our eyes to be brightened. We need energy. We need motivation to go uh, forward in this world and to do what we've been called to do. God's word does this for you, Christian. 
Are you using it? Are you reading it? Are you disciplining yourself? Uh, uh, I know I, I tend to harp on that a lot, but the reason I do is because it is so important for us. Uh, to be about the Word of God and carefully studying it and, and renewing ourselves each and every single day so uh, that our hearts don't grow cold. He says it's joy-inducing, energy-giving. Uh, but he doesn't just say that uh, so that we uh, uh, can sort of bask in all of that. There is that truth, uh, certainly. But he goes on to say in verse 11, Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Uh, what he's saying is, is that, that as we read God's word and we continue to study it all the days of our lives, that this attitude would come over us, that we have to have God's word. We have to have it. We need it even more than we need the air in our lungs or the blood flowing through our veins. It's that important, Christian, to your heart, to your soul, to your very life. And then he says, finally, that there is great warning that comes or, or great caution that, that, that God's word advises us and encourages us in. And this is so important because there are warnings in Scripture and we need to be aware of them. Um, he says in verse 12, Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. I don't think we have a clue, any of us, just how sinful we are. That we, uh, David is acknowledging here, commit sins all the time that we don't even know we're admitting, that we're, that we're committing. Um, it speaks to the seriousness of our sinful estate. Even though we are redeemed, we still sin. We really are that sinful that we commit sins that we don't even realize we're committing. We need God's law to uh, and God's word to, to point this out to us. Um, Second thing is then he says, verse 13, keep your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Uh, David's admitting here, here is the king of Israel, the uh, prototype for the example for uh, all the people of Israel to follow, admitting that there are still besetting sins in his life. And if you know the life of David, you know that, that the man sinned greatly. Uh, there's warning to us as Christians that yes, even though uh, if we were to die at this very moment, we would wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ because his work is sufficient to, to cleanse us of all of our sins, yet we still sin and we still have sins that we so quickly fall into our pet sins, the ones that we love, that we uh, uh still take great joy in indulging in. Uh, this is uh, a warning to us Christians. Uh, but then uh, thirdly, and I think this is the greatest fear here, the greatest warning, uh, then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Notice there's a progression here. Innocent sins leading to presumptuous sin, leading to great sin. We could say a lot about this. Um, obviously, this is a passage, and there are countless others in Scripture that speak of a. there are degrees of sin. Some sins are worse than others. Uh, read the larger catechism questions 150 and 151 if you uh, would disagree with that. Um, but uh, it, it, it's warning here, I think, to us as Christians uh, to not be... Uh, pompous, to not boast about uh, perfection or to even uh, boast and say, well, I would never do that. Uh, you would, uh, if given the opportunity and if given the right circumstances. And so uh, guard your heart is what David is saying here. Uh, look to the word of God, which is the only way uh, that we uh, can know 
uh, the sufficiency of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. He is the only way uh, to be healed of even the greatest of sins. His work on the cross, his work in fulfilling God's law perfectly is the only way uh, to be healed of uh, even great sins. There is no sin uh, so great uh, that it cannot be healed uh, by the work and the person of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Christian, continue uh, to look to him, uh, to know him as he's revealed to you in his word. Uh, and yes, also it is uh, helpful to get outdoors even in uh, this time of uh, quarantine and, and whatnot. There is some good to that but it'll never eclipse, it'll never be greater than uh, the revelation that we have in God's word. So make sure you're attending to that each and every single day. Take care for now, uh, be blessed, and we'll uh, talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.